The truth of the gospel includes a very small but very important phrase. Christ died for our sins. You've probably heard it before, perhaps even many times. Sometimes familiarity can lead to a diminished sense of importance. The more that you hear about something, the more ordinary it becomes. Common even, ho-hum, even boring. But this truth that Christ died for our sins is anything but common. There's another difficulty. It may happen in your ears and in your mind without you even realizing it. When the truth is declared that Christ died for our sins, you might think that you're hearing the truth. But what you're really hearing is a diminished version, a partial truth. You might be hearing this, Jesus died for your sins. Do you see the difference? You should. It's true, these statements are similar, and both may very well be true, but they aren't the same. Not even close. Take a moment to really think about this. It's important. In fact, according to the Apostle Paul, it is of first importance. In order to see the difference, we need to take a moment to discuss sin. I know, I know. That's pretty much nobody's favorite topic. Often when I'm out witnessing, I'll ask the person that I'm talking to what they think the greatest sin is. And I get a lot of different answers. Things like murder, or theft, racism, and hatred. A lot of different answers. But no matter what they say, my follow-up question usually gets the same response. When I ask them, do you know what Jesus said the greatest commandment was? The answer that I almost always get back is no. Now, most people can agree that the greatest sin, according to the Bible, would be violating the greatest commandment. However, most people don't know what the greatest commandment is, and therefore they don't know the greatest sin. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. All. 100%. It's pretty easy to give 1% of your heart, 1% of your soul, 1% of your mind, or 1% of your strength away to something lesser than God. And even though it's easy, when we do so, we are in violation of the greatest commandment of the living God. By violating God's commandments, that means that we are rebelling against the God who spoke the sun into existence, the God who raised up the mountains and who establishes the boundaries for the seas. We're in rebellion against the one who gives us air to breathe and the lungs to breathe it. Since this is true, we should be able to admit that for our entire life, we have been violating God's greatest commandment with every beat of our heart. Not only this, but then we add to this very serious violation countless other violations and transgressions. If I just look at my own life, my individual sins are more than I can calculate. They're more than the number of hairs on my head, they're more than the stars in the sky, more than the grains of sand on the seashore. And again, that's just me. If I allow the individualistic winds of our age to influence me and I hear the gospel truth not as it truly is, but in this diminished version that Christ died for my sins, well, then I have reason to glory in my God. But not as much reason as if I hear the truth as it is actually stated. The actual statement is that Christ died for our sins. All of ours. The sins of the whole church. Every person who has ever been redeemed. Every person who will ever be redeemed. Christ has died for all of our sins. This is truly spectacular. Christ dying for our is infinitely greater than Christ dying for your or for my. In Revelation, when we get a glimpse of the great multitude from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people, we are told that the group is so large that no one could count it. After these things I looked and behold, a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as someone who has experienced the gift of salvation by His grace, when I think that Christ died for me, oh, it gives me reason to praise Him. 
However, the weight of the true glory that Christ deserves is found in the larger statement that Christ died for our sins. This truth is so much bigger that it results in even those who are not redeemed praising Christ. In Revelation chapter 4, the Apostle John sees a glorious vision of the Father being praised in heaven. And in the next chapter, the praise and honor changes focus. Now it is offered to the Lamb of God. It is offered to Him because of His great worth. The Lamb of God is the only one who could die for our sins. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. This praise doesn't just come from the four living creatures. It results in the holy angels and the elders also praising him. But even this isn't enough praise. Not for Jesus. Not for the Lamb of God who was slain and who lives forevermore. In fact, the text continues to tell us that every created thing gets in on the praise. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them I heard saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Every created thing can praise Christ for this glorious truth that he died for our sins. Everything in heaven and on earth, everything under the earth and on the sea, and everything in them. Nothing in all of creation, when they see the weight of this true, glorious statement, can help themselves from declaring blessing, honor, glory, and dominion belong to the Father and to the Lamb. All because Christ died for our sins. It's a big deal. Do you understand the weight of this glorious truth? Are you exalting Christ in your own heart and mind? And are you going into the world to declare this glorious truth that there is no other name given under heaven by which we can be saved? Our sins, all of them, as weighty as they might be, can be forgiven to the praise and glory of His great name. This great truth is worthy of praise, both now and forever.